You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. The year is 65 AD. The Emperor Nero sends a military tribune to the home of his former rhetoric tutor and speechwriter, the philosopher Seneca. The officer notifies Seneca that he is being charged with participation in a thwarted conspiracy to overthrow Nero and replace him with a senator called Gaius Calpernicus Piso. The emperor asks through the tribune whether Seneca is ready to fall on his sword. In response, the Tribune reports that Seneca shows no symptom of fear, no token of sorrow, no dejected passion. His words and look bespoke a mind, serene, erect, and firm. Nero doesn't like this response. He orders the Tribune, return and tell him he must resolve to die. The officer is reluctant to obey because it is generally believed that Seneca is innocent. Nevertheless, after some hesitation, he returns to Seneca's home to enact his execution by forced suicide. When Seneca's companions begin weeping, he gently scolds them. He says, Where are the precepts of philosophy, which for years have taught us to meet the calamities of life with firmness and well-prepared spirit? Nero murdered his mother. He destroyed his brother. And after those deeds of horror, what remains to fill the measure of his guilt but the death of his guardian and his tutor. In other words, Seneca had seen it coming and is mentally prepared to meet his death. He cuts the veins in his arm, but for some reason, the blood flows slowly. He doesn't die quickly enough. He consumes a draft of poison to hasten his demise. This too fails to have the desired effect. Seneca then asks to be placed in a hot bath, where he finally succumbs and passes away. We're looking at the classic philosophical text that some consider one of the original self-help books, The Letters to Lucilius of Seneca the Younger. It is a series of 124 letters from Seneca to his friend Lucilius about applying the principles of Stoic philosophy to daily life. Seneca wrote other things, including many tragedies and essays, but the letters are what most people know him for. They have been published under several different titles, including Letters from a Stoic and Moral Epistles. Scholars believe that Seneca wrote the letters in the years just preceding his execution, around 62 to 65 AD. The letters to Lucilius provide a fairly normal and unsystematic account of a highly systematic philosophy. People love them because they're so accessible, and yet, the wisdom they contain seems timeless. Seneca was criticized by his contemporaries for writing in an aphoristic style, although it makes him very quotable. In this book insight, we'll explore the following themes. First, who was Seneca and what can we learn from him about facing adversity? Second, contemplating death and the power of mindfulness. Third, contemplation of the sage and what we gain from role models. We'll conclude by taking a look at the wider impact of Seneca and his work. Seneca was the son of an accomplished rhetorician and scholar from Cordoba, in the Roman province of Hispania, or modern-day Spain. You'll often see father and son referred to as Seneca the Elder and Seneca the Younger. The younger Seneca was enlisted as rhetoric tutor to the young Emperor Nero. He also ended up writing speeches for Nero and became his closest political advisor. He appears to have tried to teach Nero some ethical lessons from Stoic philosophy in order to moderate Nero's tendency to corrupt and violent rule. As Nero's reign degenerated further into tyranny, Seneca finally became alienated from him and retired from public life. However, Nero was worried that Seneca might become a threat because of his political influence and immense wealth, much of which was gained while in Nero's service. 
Seneca had a lot of cash and owned several villas, farm estates, and vineyards, so Nero ordered his execution on an apparently trumped-up charge of conspiracy. You heard the story of his execution earlier. Today, the adjective philosophical can mean calm in the face of adversity, which is virtually the same as the meaning given to the adjective stoic. The Stoics taught that you should build emotional resilience by preparing yourself in advance to cope wisely and dispassionately with life's misfortunes. Seneca refers to this several times throughout his writings. The basic idea is neatly expressed in the fable of Aesop, who lived before the first recorded philosophers in the 6th or 7th century BCE. It goes roughly as follows. A wild boar was sharpening his tusk against a tree when a fox came by and asked him why he was doing this. I don't see the reason, remarked the fox. There are no hunters nor hounds in sight. In fact, right now I can't see any threat at all. True, replied the boar, but when danger does arise, then it will be too late to sharpen my tusks. In letter 18, Seneca likewise advises his friend as follows. It is in times of security that the spirit should be preparing itself to deal with difficult times. While fortune is bestowing favors on it, then is the time for it to be strengthened against her rebuffs. In the midst of peace, the soldier carries out maneuvers, throws up earthworks against a non-existent enemy, and tires himself out with unnecessary toil in order to be equal to it when it is necessary. If you want a man to keep his head when the crisis comes, you must give him some training before it comes. In letter 91, he explains the Stoic teaching that emotional distress is made worse by your sense of shock or surprise when faced with an unexpected setback. This is the main reason for ensuring that nothing ever takes us by surprise. We should consider what might happen ahead of time, imagining every possibility, be it exile, torture, war, or shipwreck. Seneca calls this Stoic mindset premeditatio malorum, or premeditation of adversity. The wise person is mentally prepared for such events, accepting them as a normal part of life. Stoics rehearse the possibility that any number of typical human catastrophes might befall them just as they do other people. Seneca says that we should anticipate not only common misfortunes, but anything that could conceivably happen in a comprehensive manner. The person who has prepared themselves in advance never faces life's misfortunes as though a complete beginner. The real goal of this technique, however, is to practice viewing all manner of setbacks in life from a detached, philosophical perspective. For Stoics, all such external misfortunes are neither good nor bad, but merely opportunities for you to respond either wisely or foolishly. Having considered how Seneca prepared himself to cope with all manner of setbacks in life, we should next consider a special case, the ultimate misfortune in a sense, our own death. We'll take a break for now, but first, let's recap what we've learned so far from Seneca's letters to Lucilius. We've learned who Seneca was. Much of his philosophical mindset can be explained by the axiom prepare for everything. Through his letters, we can see he was a student of the Stoic way of life. Seneca didn't wait around for adversity, but he prepared for whatever threat might come his way. Next, we'll learn about the history and context surrounding his heavily documented death. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our exploration into the collected letters by the ancient philosopher Seneca the Younger. It's often published as the Letters to Lucilius of Seneca the Younger. Previously, we've explored who Seneca the Younger was and his background in Stoicism. Now, we'll take a look into his meditations on death and the power of mindfulness. 
premeditation of adversity finds its ultimate expression in the Stoic contemplation of death. The Stoics were influenced by Socrates, who said that philosophy itself was a lifelong preparation for dying, and that the wise feared death least of all people. Seneca says that to learn how to die is to unlearn how to be a slave. He means that by coming to terms with the inescapable fact of our own mortality, we free ourselves from many other hang-ups in life. The fear of death does us more harm than death itself, because the latter merely ends our life. The former potentially ruins our moral character. Here is a clip from Good Fortune, a Stoic podcast, regarding fear. All fear, in the Stoic view, is groundless. So do Stoics experience it? Of course. However, we do combat fear, and not by simply suppressing. We work to change the mistaken beliefs that generate and feed fear, so that it never takes root in the first place. Seneca says the acceptance of death isn't meant to be morbid. Rather, the Stoic is simply someone who enjoys life and yet is unafraid of dying. Epictetus, another famous Stoic, mentions how Roman emperors and generals celebrating a military triumph were accompanied by slaves who stood behind them in their chariot. These men held laurel crowns above their victors' heads, but were required to whisper words of caution in their ears, such as, remember, you must die. These memento mori were intended to deflate their ego and remind them to view life more realistically and philosophically by accepting their own mortality. Seneca tried to remind himself that each night as he went to bed, he might not wake up in the morning, and that upon rising, he might not make it through the day. Again, this was not morbid, but it is a way of remaining more fully grounded in the here and now. It's by accepting the certainty of our own demise that we can appreciate life more fully and to make the most of the opportunities in the present moment. Seneca provides a wonderful account of this here and now orientation based on the saying of Stoic philosopher Hecato of Rhodes, Cease to hope and you will cease to fear. He means that by grounding our awareness in the now, rather than attaching too much value to the future, we potentially free ourselves from much anxiety. Seneca also says that fear keeps pace with hope. By this, he means that both fear and hope belong to a mind in a state of anxiety about the future or the past. We're always projecting our thoughts far ahead rather than adapting ourselves to the present moment. Our ability to exercise foresight in this way, through the use of reason, should be one of humanity's greatest gifts. Instead, it often becomes our greatest curse. Seneca explains this in a very memorable passage. He writes, Wild animals run from the dangers they actually see, and once they have escaped them, worry no more. We, however, are tormented alike by what is past and what is to come. A number of our blessings do us harm, for memory brings back the agony of fear, while foresight brings it on prematurely. No one confines his happiness to the present. Seneca was one of the first critics of consumerism, saying that when we crave things, we are imagining having them in a hypothetical future, which causes a sense of pain or longing. By contrast, when we pay attention to the present moment and imagine the absence of some of the things we already have and take for granted, we naturally experience a sense of gratitude. We've considered how Seneca and the Stoics trained themselves to remain grounded in the present moment, experiencing gratitude for the things that they have. Next, we'll look at the way they trained themselves to learn from the good examples set by certain role models. We'll pause one more time, but before we go, let's go over what we've covered from the letters to Lucilius of Seneca the Younger. We've explored Seneca's here and now way of looking at foresight and hindsight. If we keep our expectations grounded in the present, we free ourselves from the anxiety of the past and future. Because of this, Seneca was able to liberate himself from the fear of death, just as the ancient Stoics built up their resilience to unwanted emotions. We'll conclude our discussion on Seneca next time. We'll go over the importance of Seneca and his legacy. <music> 
Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're concluding our exploration into Seneca's letters to Lucilius. The letters have been repurposed into a book that works like an ancient self-help guide. Previously, we've gone over how Seneca built up his resilience to emotional outburst and thus gave him a greater acceptance of death. This extended to a here-and-now mindset of keeping himself grounded in the present without worrying about the past or future. Now, we'll look at why Seneca is a role model and what we gain from contemplating his struggles. The Stoics placed more importance on teaching and learning by example than upon learning from books or verbal doctrines. Seneca writes, The road is a long one if one proceeds by way of precepts, but short and effectual if by way of personal example. He claims that early students of Stoicism didn't learn merely from lectures, but by keeping company with Zeno, the founder of the school, and studying his behavior in daily life. Likewise, he said that Plato, Aristotle, and the other students of Socrates derived more from his character than from his words. It's the most natural thing in the world for us to admire certain individuals who exhibit exceptional strength of character. Seneca puts this beautifully in one passage, which goes, If you come across a man who is never alarmed by dangers, never affected by cravings, happy in adversity, calm in the midst of storm, viewing mankind from a higher level, and the gods from their own, is it not likely that a feeling will find its way into you of veneration for him? We should therefore think carefully about our deepest values and find people who embody them. It's often difficult to find such people in daily life. However, we can use our imagination by contemplating what it is that makes certain historical or fictional characters seem admirable. We can also imagine what an ideal wise man or woman would be like and how they would respond to different challenges in life. Seneca distinguishes between using a role model as either a guardian or a model in this way. We should live as though we're being observed by the role model, imagining how they would respond to the things we're saying and doing throughout the day. This technique was used by Stoics to cultivate a kind of self-awareness or mindfulness of their own actions. The point is having some kind of standard against which to measure our own character and actions. Seneca writes, Without a ruler to do it against, you won't make the crooked straight. For the ancient Stoics, the supreme role model was Socrates, who embodied not only wisdom, but also emotional resilience, courage, and self-discipline. You may be fortunate enough to know work colleagues, friends, or family members who inspire you in this way. Nobody is perfect, however, so the goal isn't to blindly imitate the whole of someone's character, good and bad, but rather to focus on specific qualities that are worthy of emulation. The Stoics taught that at the end of each day, we should review our own actions and compare them against the standards set by our role models. In a book called On Anger, Seneca describes how each evening he would examine his own character by asking, what vices have you cured yourself of today? This idea is based on a method of cross-examining yourself taught by the ancient Pythagorean philosophers and later adopted by the Stoics. The Pythagoreans said that we shouldn't allow sleep to close our eyes before having three times reviewed the main events of the preceding day in our mind's eye, asking three questions. First, what vices or errors did you commit? Second, what did you do well that deserves praise? Third, what did you leave undone? What could be done better next time? On rising the following morning, you can then plan your behavior based on what you learn from these reflections, attempting to live more consistently in accord with your core values every day. Before we conclude, 
Let's take a quick recap. We began with the story of how Seneca faced his own unjust death with total equanimity. He had trained himself throughout his life to achieve this state of mind by following Stoic philosophy. We looked at Seneca's techniques, called premeditation of adversity, which involves regularly imagining all manner of setbacks in life as though they were already happening in order to practice coping with them rationally and calmly. Then we discussed acceptance of our own mortality, and we saw how Stoics believed that mastering our fear of death could help us become more emotionally resilient in general. We looked at the Stoic mindfulness of the here and now, which is aided by thinking of each day as though it could be our last. Finally, we examined the Stoic contemplation of role models, through which we learn how to improve our character in general. We saw how Seneca reviewed his progress at the end of each day by cross-examining his own character and actions. These are just a small sample of the many self-improvement concepts and techniques found in Seneca's writings. Although he does provide some philosophical arguments to justify his use of psychological strategies, he's generally much more concerned to show you how to apply philosophy to problems in daily life than to support them with detailed arguments. Among the topics that Seneca covers in the letters are friendship, old age, conversation, pleasure, joy, and grief. Seneca's writings have remained popular for 2,000 years, partly because they're written in such beautiful and lucid style. Some of his sayings have become famous Latin quotes, and in translation, they're frequently shared online today. It's remarkable to realize that Seneca was a contemporary of St. Paul, because his writings often seem much more contemporary in style than the New Testament. They're full of wisdom and practical guidance that you can apply to countless different situations in life. Many schools of philosophy have been sidelined into esoteric obscurity. It's rare to check the news and see an article about how David Hume's empiricism might help us to navigate an age of political uncertainty. Stoicism, on the other hand, has lost none of its currency as a guide to coping with everyday life. The success of recent bestsellers such as The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday and How to Be a Stoic by Massimo Piliucci is testament to this. People have argued that Stoicism is too negative and pessimistic and that it encourages a we-might-as-well-expect-the-worst doom-and-gloom mentality. Various psychologists have even debated whether Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh is a consummate Stoic or suffers from depression. The jury is still out on that one. But focusing on negativity is to misread the Stoics. Seneca's letters offer an empowering way to live, by being clear-sighted, accepting, and dealing with adversity head-on. It's possible to live a life of meaning and contentment in the here and now, truly enjoying nature, art, friends, and loved ones. In a way, it was harder for Seneca to follow his own teachings than anyone, given his vast wealth. The more we have, the more we want to hold on to it and enjoy it forever. Indeed, Seneca even saw the wish for more things not as a thirst, but as a disease. Of course, it was easy for him to say this when he had everything, and he seemed to work hard to justify his wealth to himself. However, the fact that Seneca, despite the many comforts and enjoyments, accepted his eventual fate with such equanimity, suggests that he did walk his own talk in terms of following Stoic philosophy. It suggests that he gained a freedom of mind that was worth far more than anything material. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice.